Hello everyone, thank you very much for coming. This is, uh, I mean, I'm amazed how many people that, that are here. Uh, thank you very much for your interest. We are greatly honored to have Professor Jerzy Pehe here and uh, his translator, Gerald Turner, Irishman who speaks absolutely fantastic. I'm not an Irishman. Well, I, you're not? No. Right, oh, you lived in Ireland. Yes. All right. Doesn't make me an Irishman. Okay. So Makes so. my kids Irish. All right. Fine. Uh, uh, speaks with an Irish accent and an absolute fantastic uh, uh, native Czech, which is which is amazing. Um, Professor Pehe left Czechoslovakia uh, defected in eighty one, uh, uh, in a, well, uh, uh, sort of when he was about twenty five, roughly. Uh, studied in America. Uh, later became. Head of the research uh, department of Radio Free Europe in Munich, which was an American station uh, broadcasting to Eastern Europe. Uh, after the fall of communism, became a uh, top advisor of uh, President Václav Havel. In fact, I don't know if these are indiscretions, I will not, uh, but he was telling me how Havel and he met the Queen in Aberdeen, English Queen. And uh, uh, it was really quite interesting. English, in yes. English, in yeah, Indeed. in London, right? Not in Aberdeen then. Uh, that she displayed quite stunning, but I'm not going to go into the details, um, uh, f f forms of uh, uh, really quite subversive humor, which is not something that you uh, expect of good old Elizabeth, but I'm reading. Anyway, <clears throat> Professor uh, Behe is also uh, um, currently, he's, uh, for many years now, he's been the head of New York University in Prague. Um, the Prague branch, and uh, he's also he, he's, he's a very well-known commentator whenever anybody is interested in anything about the Czech Republic or Central Europe from uh, newspapers like Washington Post, the Irish Times, uh, New York Times, whatever they go, and everybody constantly quotes Professor Jerzy Pehe. He's also a novelist, and um, he's written several novels. This one has come out in English, Three Faces of uh, of an angel and it's quite interesting in the sense because it provides a framework for what we're going to be talking about here because it kind of broadens the issue of the fall of communism and what is now whatever to a wider look at the 20th century. Professor Pehe, uh, 30 years ago, 17th of November, fall of communism and now over to you. What do you think? <coughs> Well, <clears throat> well, thank you for the invitation, and uh, thank you that uh, I can uh, I can talk to you. Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, really uh, my experience from uh, from Prague is that it really depends. Uh, the answer to this question depends on whether you are an optimist or a pessimist. And uh, I have some colleagues who uh, think that. Uh, the glass is uh, half empty, and I personally think that uh, the glass is half full, uh, that we are uh, somewhere in the middle of, uh, of a very difficult transformation which uh, started 30 years ago, and of course in, in many ways uh, it has been uh, spectacularly uh, successful. The Czech Republic is a very successful, uh, it's very successful economically. Uh, but there are still many, many problems, uh, especially uh, with uh, uh, the understanding of, of liberal democracy, um, some problems in the media. I think that civil society uh, certainly um, needs to be more developed to, to sustain, to support uh, uh, political democracy, and so on. So um, I see, I see. Uh, where we are today um, on sort of a timeline, um, and I very often cite uh, Ralph Darendorf, who uh, 30 years ago wrote a f famous essay in which he predicted that uh, uh, creating a uh, sort of facade of, uh, of uh, political democracy will take two or three years, uh, market economy uh, about five years, uh, but uh, uh, a full-fledged democracy, uh, uh, he predicted, will take uh, creating full-fledged democracy will take about 60 years, and which is not, of course, um, for many people very encouraging because some people will not live that long. But uh, certainly, um, uh, when I look at his predictions today, I think that he was more or less right because he predicted 
uh, that uh, we need a generational change and we need people who internalize uh, uh, certain values which are important for democracy and uh, and I sort of agree I would I would quote our uh, first president uh, of Czechoslovakia I mean 1918 Tomáš Garik Masaryk who was um, asked uh, about uh, the state of democracy in Czechoslovakia at the time and he said well we have democracy but we also need some democrats and uh, I think that this, this problem of democracy without democrats is still uh, pertinent and um, and hopefully uh, it will change uh, uh, with time uh, and I think that we have been given a good chance because unlike Czechoslovakia in 1938 when it was an island of democracy surrounded by authoritarian regimes uh, we are now part of a family of, uh, of nations that are uh, supporting democracy, supporting uh, the transition and so um, for me uh, the glass is uh, half full. This afternoon Mr. Rychetsky in Prague gave a very stunning speech which is already kind of discussed on the social networks. He's basically saying that the country has turned against the legacy of Václav Havel and he is very critical uh, of the fact that the and he basically says that it's the politicians both east and west because apparently I mean that you had the financial crisis in 2008 and since then everything has kind of become destabilized and what helped this in inverted commas um, was the refugee crisis and he basically said that it is outrageous that uh, the Czech Republic can't even accept 30 ch ch uh, child refugees from uh, from the Greek uh, camps. Um, and he was actually saying that quite a lot of people do not really feel that what exists now in Eastern Europe is their own. That, uh, I mean, 10% uh, uh, of the population of the Czech Republic is affected by bailiffs because they are basically in debt slavery and all that. And uh, so don't, I don't want to be too critical, he also said that he feels that Hungary and Poland is far, far worse and that basically it looks within those countries much worse than, uh, than when you look at it from, from outside. When you, could you, could you tell the, uh, the, uh, the present here, when you returned from America, how did you come to be at the castle, how did you become a... Uh, 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 Václav Havel's top advisor, and uh, what was it like, and uh, were you wrong? <laughs> because everything looked kind of fine for the first 10 years or something, you know? Well, uh, so I came back in a way twice, because I came back uh, <clears throat> right after uh, the revolution started. I was uh, in Munich, in the Radio Free Europe at the time, and actually there's a short story of, um, uh, that I will tell you about about that, which uh, I think uh, sort of describes the regime change in a, in a very uh, very interesting way. Uh, it was um, about two days or three days after the revolution started, and uh, the head of the Czechoslovak broadcasting section, uh, Pavel Techaček, came back from Prague, and uh, I should say that he was the first uh, Czechoslovak journalist from Radio Free Europe who was allowed to go to Prague in the entire existence of Radio Free Europe because Radio Free Europe was considered to be the enemy of, of communism and so he was allowed to go there to, to cover the canonization of Saint, Saint Agnes of Bohemia so it was a religious uh, affair they allowed him to, uh, to, to go and the revolution started and, uh, and he took his equipment and moved to Hotel Europa uh, in Wenceslav Square and started broadcasting over the phone and he was the first one to report on the I event. heard it and it was absolutely stunning when you have a station which is regarded as the arch enemy and suddenly you hear this is Pavel Pechacek I'm speaking to you from Wenceslav Square Prague yes. this was this was like uh, I mean what yeah so this is this is what he did for about two days and then um, because Czechoslovak television was still not showing any pictures or Czech, uh, Czechoslovak radio was not broadcasting about these events, so uh, after about two days he was uh, arrested by secret police and they took him to the border and virtually, literally kicked him across the borderline and said don't come back. And so he, he came uh, to Munich uh, quite disheveled, I have to say, didn't look uh, well, and, uh, and he was telling us what happens to him. And, 
and uh, then the management of Radio Free, Radio Free Europe, uh, we were all sitting there and uh, they said, well, this is really bad, but unfortunately we need to send, uh, we need to send someone else immediately. And uh, they looked at me because I had the American passport. So uh, I wasn't really pleased uh, at that moment when, when I saw him, but I went. And, uh, and uh, I had to go to Bonn to pick up uh, my uh, visa. And uh, so I arrived in Bonn, and uh, uh, when I when I went into the embassy, the um, this, the staff of the embassy completely was uh, welcoming me. They were all there, and all of these uh, former agents and spies and so on uh, were telling me how pleased they were to see me because they 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 had listened to Radio Free Europe for so many years and. This, they are so glad that freedom, freedom has, fin has finally come. So I, I knew that in that moment that the, the regime collapsed. And, uh, and then I went to Prague. I spent two weeks in Prague and um, uh, witnessed uh, some of the events there. And then on the 10th of uh, December, uh, <coughs> the, the government of national reconciliation was formed. It was uh, have dissidents as communists. It was an agreement. And I went to visit a, a dissident whose name was Petr Uhl. And Petr Uhl was our long-time correspondent, a very, a very courageous man. And um, this happened on the day when this uh, government was formed, and I went to his apartment. And uh, when, I, when I entered, I hear the phone. The phone rang, and Petr picked up the phone. And um, uh, there was a man asking about uh, whether he and another dissident, Jerzy Ginsbier, will be coming to work in the evening. Uh, I should say that he, Peter Uhl, and Jiří Dinsbír worked as coal stokers in a boiler room. It was a very desired job by many uh, dissidents because they could read, you know, it was warm and they could stoke, stoke coal. And so this man was a professional coal stoker. And he calls and says, uh, so are you coming to work today? And uh, Uhl says, well, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but Dinsbír was just appointed the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Czechoslovakia. There was this long silence. and. Uh, and then the man says, so is he coming to work or not? <laughs> and uh, and uh, Ul says, well, actually he's coming this uh, evening because he doesn't want to leave you in a bind, but uh, you know, he has to bring his suit because tomorrow morning he's going on an official visit of Germany as the Minister of Foreign Affairs. So there was, a, there was a history just in front of your eyes. And then the man says, what about you? Are you also a minister of something now? And Ul says, well, actually, no, but I'll be with you for two more weeks. But as of January 1st, uh, I'll be the general director of, of the Czechoslovak press agency. And so that was, um, that was right there in front of my eyes. This is how I witnessed uh, the change. And of course, uh, uh, I kept coming, uh, visiting Prague. Um, but I stayed in Munich until 1994 uh, as the head of the, of the, of the research uh, and analysis department. And then um, the radios moved to Prague, so I moved uh, back with, uh, with the radios. Um, and then one day uh, I got a phone call from uh, this man. Uh, actually, it was also quite funny because my secretary said, um, you know, um, there is someone, someone is calling you, he's on the line, and he claims to be President Havel. And, um, <laughs> And I thought immediately, okay, this is one of those uh, TV programs. <laughs> <laughs> there is a hidden camera there filming me, and uh, and uh, this is a prank. This is clear. But I took the phone, and the man certainly sounded like Václav Havel. And I said, you know, I, 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 we don't know each other, but I have read your articles and listened to your commentaries. And would you would you come to to see me? So uh, so I went, and this is how our the cooperation started basically. <laughs> called me and asked me to, to work with him. So How long did you work there? Well, I worked there, uh, as the head of his political department for uh, two and a half years, and then I decided so that uh, politics is not really my cup of, uh, you would say, tea here, right? Not cup of toffee, coffee. And so um, I, uh, uh, I went to uh, back to academia and uh, took over. Uh, Prague branch of New York University, but I stayed on. We agreed that I would stay on as, as his external advisor for uh, for the for the rest of his presidency, which was until until 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so you were there about 
what, eight years, really? Or? I worked with him for about, yeah, about seven, eight years. Yeah. What did you do there, and what was it like? Well, uh, okay, so uh, what is it like to, to have uh, a, a, a big uh, bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic institution? Uh, basically, I had, uh, as the head of political department, I was in charge of about uh, 30 or 40 uh, analysts who all uh, specialists who all specialized in different uh, countries around the world um, and they were sort of house advisors on those particular parts of the world and then uh, about 10 or 15 people who dealt with domestic politics um, so that was that was the department and uh, my role was to um, somehow uh, synthesize the, all this information and bring it in some a digestible package to the president, uh, of course, also to accompany him at various uh, meetings and uh, uh, tra trips abroad and, and so on. So it was really a, a very intensive period and uh, and um, uh, I enjoyable in some ways, although I, as I said, I didn't like being in politics, so I left, but uh, enjoyable in the sense of, uh, of being able to work with uh, someone who was really um, a great human being with a sense of humor and um, uh, and in some ways a genius, I would say, playwright, and uh, but really uh, uh, a man of uh, of remarkable um, abilities. Thank you. Before further questions, let's go over to to uh, uh, Gerald, who was actually right there on the 17th of November in Prague as a reporter for the BBC. He used to write articles and. He, he uh, when he we published a lot of Czech fiction in translation under the acronym of AG Brain. So uh, yes, you did it with your wife. Uh, tell us w your, about your experience since uh, 30 years ago this month in Prague. How did you get there, and uh, what was it like? It's rather interesting. It was July '89. Um, at the time, I've been I, I was working for since about 1986. I've been working for the. Documentation Center for Independent Czechoslovak Literature, which was then based in, in Scheinfeld in Bavaria, led by uh, Willem Prechan, an excellent historian. Czech historian. Uh, and what they were doing was producing um, uh, collections of writings by uh, band authors, um, Havel, Batsulik, uh, Klima, and so they would produce digests and uh, um, to, so that, in fact, you know that, that, that uh, there should be some consciousness within within the Western world of what was happening in Czechoslovakia, which was singularly ignored, as I can uh, witness from 1980, or from in fact from from you know as soon as it uh, uh, went cold after three years after the the occupation. Um, you know, newspapers like The Guardian singularly ignored what was happening and in fact uh, I recall very well in the 80s that the, you know, um, what's his name then, the, uh, the political editor of the, the Guardian, awful man, um, terrible Maoist. And, and uh, he, 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 he... You mean him, Seamus? No, it wasn't no. Seamus, no, 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 not, not Corbyn Seamus, no, no, no. But, um, I mean, you couldn't you couldn't even get a letter in the in, in the col in the, in the columns of the Guardian about Czechoslovakia at the time. It was it was a, at all critical. Um, and so I've been I've been doing this work as a, you know as a, translating uh, a lot of Czech dissident writers, uh, mostly extracts, but also I, I, I translated uh, a novel by by Ivan Klima, and I, I translated speeches and articles by Václav Havel during the, the late eighties. Um, and then suddenly, you know, uh, things started to happen. Um, ja what was known as the hot January of, of 1989, when uh, the commemoration of Jan Patochka's self-immolation, Jan, Jan Palak, yeah. sorry, <laughs> Jan Palak's self-immolation in, in, Janu in January led to um, uh, police violence uh, and, and the arrest of Václav Havel, among others. Um, and uh, during the summer, things started to happen. Well, there, there had been um, in '88 when there had been the first permitted demonstration, of course, on, on Human Rights Day in November. Um, there had been you know, a certain loosening, uh, 